Hello. If you are watching this presentation online, there probably is an algorithm that thinks you should see it. This is unlike you nice people in the audience here, who all came here out of your own free will. At least, I hope so. <laughs> but for those people online, why is that algorithm there? What does it know about them? And can we influence it? I'm Martin Schenk, the co-founder of fact-checking website leadstories.com, and I'm here today to talk to you about social media recommendation algorithms. And also, um, why they are so often blamed for the spread of false information online. More importantly, what can we do about it? So, what makes social media platforms such fertile breeding grounds for what we in the fact-checking business often call with a technical term, complete bullshit? <laughs> Did somebody maybe find a way to hack these social media platforms? perhaps by playing with people's emotions? Let me give you a recent example to show you what I mean. A few weeks ago, my colleague Sarah Thompson alerted me to a series of Facebook posts she found that all looked like this. They all had a picture of a cute dog and some text asking for help in reuniting this poor animal with its desperate owner. And there were dozens of such posts, all with the same text. The only difference was that each text had a different name of a different town or city. And all these posts were published in local Facebook groups for those locations. Now, what I love about my job is that we get to investigate puzzles like these and figure out what's going on here. And very often what we find is that somebody is manipulating people's emotions in order to exploit a social media recommendation algorithm. And that is exactly what is going on here. Because once these posts got enough likes and shares from concerned animal lovers, who wouldn't like these posts, then these posts would be edited and instead they would show some kind of real estate scam that these people were running that led you to a website where they would steal your financial and personal information. Now, the Facebook algorithm was helping them do it because the more people liked these posts, the more people got to see these posts. So maybe I should take a step back here and talk a little bit about why Facebook needs an algorithm and what an algorithm is anyway. Because, yeah, an algorithm, we all know from school, it's just a list of steps and rules that you can use to solve a particular problem. And some algorithms can be really simple and have really simple rules, but the right algorithm can be worth a lot of money. Take, for example, Amazon.com they could run an algorithm over their sales data and then notice, hey, people who buy toilet paper, very often they also buy air fresheners. So the next guy who puts a roll of toilet paper in their shopping basket, pop up, hey, would you like to buy some air fresheners? ka -ching! and billions of dollars in extra sales. All thanks to the algorithm. The same goes for a, a video streaming service, for example, that wants to know which movies or which shows to recommend so users keep paying for their subscription fees. They could use an algorithm to analyze their viewing data and then divide their viewers into groups based on what shows and movies they like to watch. And then they can base recommendations to those users on what other people in those same groups watched. And again, this is far cheaper than hiring a movie critic for every individual user. So, social media platforms essentially need to solve the same problem. What's the next thing that we are going to recommend to a user in their timeline so they stay engaged on our website or in our app so we can show them more ads? That's their business model. So they put some very smart engineers on it and they came up with an algorithm. And what works best is to show people more of the same kind of stuff that they already liked and engaged with before. And yeah, it's social media, so these engineers have a lot of data to work with. They literally know where you live, who all your friends are, 
and what groups you're a part of. So they can tailor these recommendations to a very fine degree. Um, this might all sound very Orwellian, but it's just dumb mathematics. Counting peop what people liked and then giving them more of the same so to keep them hooked. It's like a drug that changes its effect to become the one that the user craves most. And just like drugs, of course, this too can be abused. Take, for example, uh, a couple of months ago, when me and my colleagues were looking through a bunch of political Facebook groups, always searching for the next story to fact check, when to our great surprise, we started seeing a lot of articles in these groups claiming that certain American celebrities had died. For example, poor Bruce Willis here, who is, by the way, at the time of speaking, I just checked, still alive. But the people who clicked on these uh, messages, they were taken to a website full of pop-ups, banner ads, advertising everywhere. And anywhere you clicked, these people behind these websites made a little, a little bit of money. But who were these people? We decided to find out. So it turns out these websites were all being run by a group of Cambodian IT students. We actually found their Facebook page with their picture and, and posts where they were bragging how much money they were making with this scheme. So these guys had successfully figured out that older Americans who like to argue about politics on Facebook generally also are fans of older American celebrities. And by exploiting that emotional connection, they were making a nice chunk of money for themselves. So, all of this by successfully figuring out which groups respond well to which emotional impulses. And social media platforms and their algorithms are really fast at figuring out what groups you belong to and what kind of stuff you like. If you start from a blank profile on any of the major platforms and you use it for just a few hours, clicking around, liking, sharing, swiping, whatever, after a few hours, these algorithms, they will have already figured out if you like cute animals better, or maybe stand-up comedy, or, or maybe dancing girls, maybe with hula hoops, who knows? <laughs> and um, they will start serving you more of it. But they will also figure out some really personal things about you that you didn't even explicitly tell them about. Um, they, they might even figure out your sexual orientation or even your political views just based on your behavior. So in effect, these algorithms, they become a mirror, a mirror that shows you what you like. And so I find it very funny every time there is some politician that says, hey, there is too much kinky porn on my timeline. Something should be done about it. Yeah, no, uh, that's not the algorithm's fault. <laughs> but yeah, if, if your hair looks bad, you, you don't blame the mirror for that. Uh, if you frown at the mirror, of course the mirror will frown back at you. Uh, and if you give it a wide smile, then, oh, yeah, hang on a second. There, there seems to be something wrong with my mirror. Uh, it's making me look fat for some reason. I don't know. It's, it's, I guess it must be broken or, or deformed or something. Let's, let's put it away. No, just like mirrors, algorithms can also be deformed to make things look bigger than they really are or more important. And that's called advertising. But in general, for these algorithms on social media, what works best is to show people stuff that makes them feel things. For example, a cute animal video, or an inspiring TED talk, right? Or maybe some news that makes your blood boil. It's no wonder that the social media companies added buttons like these so they could better measure what piece of content gets an emotional reaction and how strong it is. So, um, of course, uh, fake news hooks into this same mechanism. If people are angry or scared or indignant, 
they stop thinking and they start writing an angry comment right away. You, you've all been there online, you've seen those comments. And, um, th but don't blame those people for that. It's, it's only natural. It's, it's how humans are. We evolved to be this way. Imagine back in the early days of the human race on the savanna, if somebody yelled, TIGER! Then the annoying guy who stopped and asked for source, please, or fact check, please, <laughs> that was probably the guy that got eaten first. <laughs> so we evolved to immediately respond to messages about danger. And if you have a piece of information that you believe will protect your friends, your family, your community from danger, it's literally inhumane not to tell them, right? So even if it turns out later that that piece of information that you have is false, maybe there was some kind of misunderstanding going on, or maybe somebody made it up for political, religious, or economic reasons, who knows? There's a lot of reasons to make up stuff. A few years ago, Professor Peter Burger from the University of Leiden and myself, we investigated a network of websites that were spamming Facebook and Twitter with scary stories about Muslims, migrants, and refugees doing terrible things all over Europe. There was just one problem. Most of these stories were either very old, just not true, or they didn't even happen in Europe. But people were liking and sharing these stories anyway, maybe to express their political viewpoint, but also because they felt they needed to warn their community against all these dangers. What the people liking and sharing these articles did not know, however, was that they were actually making a small group of friends from the town of Kumanovo in Macedonia very rich. Because when we looked into it, these websites were actually being run by um, a policeman, a truck driver, a civil servant, a school teacher, even a soldier in the Macedonian army. Uh, we tracked them down, we called them on the phone, and at first they pretended they didn't speak English, so we called back with an interpreter. And then they said, oh, uh, we know nothing, we must have been hacked, uh, but the hackers must have been listening because half an hour later all these websites were offline suddenly. I don't know how that works, good hackers. But these people, they weren't doing any of this for any sort of political reasons. No, they just wanted to make some extra money to supplement their salary in Macedonia. And the best way they knew how to do that was to run a few websites, put a lot of ads and banners and pop-ups on them, and then make them go viral. And in their experience, what worked best to go viral were these stories that made people angry and scared and afraid. And these stories didn't even have to be new. Any old story that worked in the past, they could just reuse it, so, so they did. Far cheaper, far easier for them. So yeah, there we are as fact checkers. There's not much we can do here except saying, hey, that story is false. Hey, that story came from a satire website. Hey, that story didn't actually happen in Europe. We can only put up warning messages like, hey, the objects in the mirror may be faker than they appear. And we can't delete these stories, we can't censor them, and we don't want to. Uh, as fact checkers, our job is to add more information and then hope that people will draw their own conclusion. So that's our job as fact checkers, but maybe as a society there is something more we can do about this problem. Uh, maybe somebody suggested we should make a law to ban fake news or we should ban these social media algorithms. Well, let me do something unusual for a fact checker, and that is give my opinion, because we never do that usually. We just say if it's true or false. But in this case, I think those laws would be a really bad idea. Regulating speech is always very tricky and there's always unforeseen consequences. So I don't think we should go that way. Uh, as fact checkers, we always recommend adding more information when there is a problem. Nobody says that putting a warning label on a dangerous product or putting an ingredient list on food is censorship. And I think we should do the same with social media and their algorithms. Warning, 
our algorithm has detected you are a 47 year old Belgian with a weight problem. And here are some people trying to sell you pills. Or warning, our algorithm has detected that you like scary medical stories. You are 62% gullible and there is a 95% chance you will like and share this video. None of this involves banning or censoring anything, but it might hopefully open some eyes. But yeah, that's, uh, that's for the politicians to do. Um, is there nothing we can do as individuals in the face of these algorithms, or are we completely powerless? Well, I don't think so. When I look out into this auditorium, I see a crowd of individuals. And we know that the algorithms go where the crowd goes. We also know that the algorithms learn by watching what we do. So what if we were to watch what we feed to the algorithms? So next time you're scrolling through Facebook or Twitter or social media and you see a piece of content that gives you an emotional reaction, stop. Don't go for that clickbait headline. Google that thing before you share it. Like and share a fact check now and then, please. The plain truth is often boring, so it needs all the help it can get on social media. Like it, share it, bookmark it. Don't just do it for the quality of your own timeline, because you know everything you do will be used to recommend things to others. Let's use that knowledge for good, shall we? And before I forget, please like and share this video. <laughs> because now you know why it is so important. Thank you.